with how prices on houses and everything are high, I'm I'm pretty comfortable with keeping that much kind of on the sidelines. You're you're getting paid right now for patience to to be somewhat patient with everything. So I, I've kind of you know my my grandpa used to say they can take everything away from you, but they can't take what's in between your ears. So. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it makes a lot of sense. The more knowledge you have, the better you, off you are. And I credit so much of where I'm at now to just being behind the wheel of the truck and listening to podcasts. It's Welcome millionaires and future millionaires. You're listening to the Millionaires Unveiled podcast, the show where you'll hear the stories and interviews of everyday millionaires. We'll unveil their decisions, their strategies, and their portfolio allocation. Now to your host, Jace Mattinson. Welcome back to another episode of the Millionaires Unveil Podcast. This is episode number 303. Stace, what's going on? You got a, you got a, uh, a quick-witted line for me this week? I don't, but just before you started recording, you were doing this check, check, one, two, three, and it just sounded more serious than I was anticipating, but I'm glad that the mic is working. <laughs> I always have to do that. I got to make sure the mic's working. So I guess well, we're mid-summer here, and we've already started kind of winding down the summer planning and began fall planning this week. So that's exciting. Yeah, it's always a little wild. I feel a little overwhelmed at the beginning of the summer trying to think about how to structure the summer without structure <laughs> and uh and and then i get into a groove and then before i know it summer's coming to a close yeah and i guess this is our first first go around with the kids kind of having somewhat of a normal school schedule or at least more than one of them and pretty soon we'll be sending all three of them to preschool kindergarten crazy crazy so let's get start out with the review this week that we got uh from Cy power 34 says, phenomenal fo- podcast. Love listening to all the stories and how the different millionaires made their money. Keeps me motivated and on track. Thanks for continuing to turn out great podcasts. Appreciate that side power. Once again, if you have not left a review, please do so. Either iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you listen to your podcast, get your content. We're getting more and more on Spotify as well. Welcome to Engage uh, on there. There's some Q&A on some of the the episodes and stuff that we've started doing. So, uh, yeah, appreciate those that have left reviews so far. We're almost, uh, to 800 here on iTunes anyway. So, uh, getting close, getting close to that 800 mark. And I'm glad side power brought up different guests. Cause this week's guest is a garbage man, which we'll get into in a, in a second, but first time we've had, uh, that profession on. In fact, I think one of the most downloaded episodes to date still is uh, our janitor. So we'll see if the the garbage man this time or this go around can uh, can top that. But yeah. So before we get into the detail of Jeff, if you'd like to be on the show, send us an email, millionairesunveiled at gmail.com. If you haven't heard your profession or haven't heard your story, We'd obviously love to uh, to interview you, and those that maybe feel like they have heard their story, please do and re- or please go ahead and reach out. Uh, we'll uh, get you scheduled and get you uh, recorded. And uh, yeah, appreciate those that uh, continue to do so, and those that have shared their stories thus far. I read an article this week that I thought was really interesting. It was about Warren Buffett's. Uh, wife, how she was bothered at this, I don't even know, it's the, the Sun Valley Summit or whatever. I don't know exactly what they call it, but they uh, it's where all the billionaires gather in the summer. You know, they go on vacations together. I think it's some kind of conference, it sounds like. Yeah, but it's for billionaires. We were invited. No. So, but she was complaining or overheard, I should say, complaining about $4 coffee. Which I thought was interesting because here you have, and, and, and Warren Buffett's frugality is pretty well known. He still lives in the same house that he bought for, I think it's like $31,000. And one of the only splurges he's really kind of indulged in is, is traveling by, by private airfare. But at any rate, the, the frugality still has never left them, even though he has been at different times the richest man, if not one of the top five richest men uh, in the world that he you know, 
hasn't changed his lifestyle, so to speak. Still eats McDonald's, still drinks his Diet Coke daily and, and, uh, everything else. So, I mean, Stace, you got on me for being frugal sometimes, but like Warren Buffett's there. No, I, th- I think it's a good, I think it's a good practice and, you know, everyone may have their, what well, everybody has what's important to them to spend money on. Obviously for them, it's, it's not coffee. I think there are so many ways that you can save in the long run and that you should save in the long run. Don't spend it where it doesn't matter. Spend it where it does matter. Save it where it doesn't matter. And, and I think it's, it's always good to keep in mind, you know, is there something you're definitely overspending on? I know when I'm at the grocery store, I'm thinking about how I can save money. I like to buy my spices in the bulk section, uh, looking at what the price per, per ounce is on, on different items, lots of ways to save. And, and we really should keeping that frugality in mind, spend it where it matters. Don't spend it where it doesn't matter. Yeah, I mean, a $4 coffee is not going to change his life, but I think it goes back to the concept of perceived value. And for, for her specifically in that moment, the perceived value of that coffee was not $4, and she was bothered by it. And right. Well, she she said that she could she could buy nearly a pound of coffee for the correct. same amount. So. so the perceived value of that coffee at $4 just wasn't there for her. And I think it's a great lesson, even from, from a, the wife of a billionaire, that – you know, everything does have a value to it. And some people are going to value things differently. I, I think back and I, I may have shared this story on the podcast before, but there was a time you and I were traveling to Las Vegas and I don't remember the time of year. All I remember it was super hot. So it had to probably been summer and we were thirsty as all get out. And I bought like a $10 bottle of water that I just thought was absurd. But at the time it, the value was there because <laughs> All I wanted was water, whether it was ten dollars or twenty dollars or fifty dollars, I was buying it and they capitalized on it. That's true. Love that lesson on frugality. Thank you, Warren Buffett's wife. You know, something else I've been thinking about the last couple of weeks is gratitude and the impact that it can make on our lives and on our children's lives. Recently, our kids have been in a little bit of a period of complaining a little bit, some whining. These are kind of trademarks, hallmarks of of young kids. And something I've been doing recently is stopping my kids when they start complaining about something. Maybe we didn't have the food that they wanted for dinner, or it can be, I mean, it could be anything. I gave them the wrong color plate. (laughs) But, um, you know, when it's really, so something I've been doing when this happens is stopping them in their tracks and have them name three things they're thankful for. And as helpful as that is of an exercise for our kids. I've also done it with myself. So if you find yourself feeling a little bit down, feeling like you might have some internal complaining or see it in your kids or your family, you can take a second, think of at least three things you're thankful for. And it kind of helps turn the mood around and, uh, and move forward with a little bit more gratitude in your heart. Thanks Stace. So this week we have Jeff, as I mentioned, he's a garbage man. He's 48 years old. He has a net worth of $1.5 million, 250000 of that's in his pension. He's about $700,000 in rental property equity across five rentals. He's about $300,000 of, of equity in his primary residence. He has another about 130000 in a brokerage. It's mainly invested in some index funds, but he does have a couple individual stocks. And he has about another 100K in another uh, brokerage type account and about just under $100,000 in cash. He's been a garbage man for 21 years. We discussed a little bit of uh, some of the odd jobs that he had post high school. Started making $4 an hour at his first restaurant job when he was junior high school. So great episode this week with Jeff. Uh, I will mention on this one too, we get into uh, you know a couple tough tough uh, topics. He shares uh, some things about uh, his personal life and how it relates to, to finances and, and it's very raw. So I just wanted to throw that out there. It's kind of a, a warning, but also to some degree, I really appreciate Jeff uh, sharing that. Cause I think it will probably resonate with, with some people as it did me. Uh, last week we had Orr, the net worth of $4 million. Most of that was in real estate crossed 11 single family rentals and an Airbnb. So without any further delay, let's get into the episode with Jeff. Jeff, do you want to just give us a little about your background and what you're up to now? 
I'm a garbage man by trade. Uh, I haven't heard anybody on your show as of yet that has been a garbage man, so maybe a little bit different of an angle to go by. Uh, I learned everything that I've put to uh, put to test through podcasts and audiobooks. Uh, spending my time behind the wheel of the garbage truck all day gets kind of boring and I kind of get bored of just listening to music or talk radio or anything like that. So I've always been really interested in finance and I just decided, you know, I'm going to start to learn about financing through podcasts and see what these people that are living in these big homes that are not going to work. There's a lot of neighborhoods that I would pick up that were, uh, you know, gated communities or what have you, and people would be home, and these are multi million dollar homes. And I just kind of, instead of being envious of them, I would kind of, what is the angle that they are taking? Why are they able to stay home? And here I'm working so hard and feel like I'm not going very far with anything. Um, I've always been a great natural saver. In fact, back in 2010. I saw about how much money I, I had in the bank compared to what I was taking home. So I kind of drew a line of a budget and said, you know, I can take home $800 a week, no problem. Anything more than that, I could put in a savings account and I'll never miss it. And I was working a lot of hours. So, I'd, you know, I'd make, you know, 80 to $200 more a week um, than that. So as the years went by, I started building more savings. I would get raises. I'd work more out. Um, I got a job promotion. Um, I've been a garbage man for 21 years, by the way. So with each time, I would never miss that extra money or ever see it because it was being put into a savings account. Kind of worked down the line. And it got bigger and bigger and bigger. And I started listening to this podcast. And I'm, I'm going, okay, so if I'm saving as well as I am and as good as I am, why am I not? doing that well and i you know i I went in uh and i i saw someone uh, a broker talked to him a little bit this was 2007 and he said okay what you got to do is an ira so i started an ira with him and i got a bad taste in my mouth when the market dropped Uh, my ex-wife and i had invested four thousand each and it got cut in half pretty fast in 2008 She told me, you know, I don't want to ever invest again. And I said, well, you just got to kind of go with the flow from what I understand. And, you know, little by little, it it came back. Um, But it took me a while to actually invest again in the market. I I invest in the market, but I'm not a huge fan of it because I don't have a lot of control over it. And that's what I love about real estate so much is you have more control over it. But um, I guess I'm jumping ahead a little too much here. So... I started listening to podcasts. I discovered a lot, lot of different ones, um, all all real estate, you know, or all the podcasts would always come back to index investing and real estate investing as the biggest ones. And I had always heard people tell me about their uncle or their brother's cousin's friend who had a, a, a rental property and the people destroyed it. They ruined it. And you get that kind of that, I don't know if I want to do it then. It's it's not going to be very good if they're not doing well, then how can I do anything better than what they're doing? So listening to these podcasts, I started getting more and more confidence. Um, A cousin of mine actually had a rental property. I talked to him a little bit about it. And then I kind of realized, well, I have a handful of friends that are in the trades, so if I do invest in a property and I run into a problem, maybe I could talk to one of them and they'll help me through it. I won't spend a lot of money. And, um, 2016 rolled around and I decided to invest in my first property. And and it was a former foreclosure. The bank and went in and they made some repairs on it. And, um, I, I picked up that one and put it up for rent, just a little bit of work. And almost immediately, within days, I had several people. I went through them all, and I got my first tenant in there. And then I talking to my realtor, which actually my realtor, kind of funny side story. She, uh, I went to grade school with her, 
and we actually graduated together as well. We went and looked at a handful more houses around February, since the one went so well, and accidentally stumbled upon a duplex. And uh, I looked at the the house, and I just I was like, "It's actually pretty nice, you know. Like, uh, this is you know pretty good. We'll we'll check it out." We, we go into the upstairs, not even knowing that it was a duplex, and she goes, "Oh my God, this is two units." And that was 2017. Things weren't really selling like they are now. And I put in a very low offer. They counter offered and uh, accepted. Uh, yeah, I accepted their counter offer, and I put it, you know, put it up for rent. And then I put the upper unit up for rent. And then I realized at that point my mortgage, in comparison to my cash flow, was equal to one of my paychecks. It was almost. Well, it was over $1,000 a month in just cash flow off of that one house. So I knew right there that I could replace a paycheck this way. Um, you always hear about the 4% rule and, and that, you know, if you have a million dollars, well, you could spend 40000 a year. You're not going to lose all your, you know, you're not going to run out of money. I wasn't thinking that I'd be able to save a million dollars. So this was a great way to offset that. So with each rental property, which I'm up to uh, five rental properties now, and I'm actually somewhat content where I'm at, um, unless something comes across that really sparks my interest. I think I'm going to stay probably there for now as I pay them down, but I'm up to five properties and uh, three of which are duplexes. And all my properties, um, except for my first property, pay me around a thousand dollars a month. So I base it that's in cash flow uh, beyond the beyond the um, mortgage payment, insurance, everything. That's after all costs. I still take in over a thousand a month on each property, except for my first one. I'm, I'm going to stop you real quick. Just I, I want to get into this in, in in greater depth, but given of so much here right off the bat, so. Been a commercial garbage man for 21 years. Is that correct? Uh, get garbage man for 21 years in in the commercial line for two. Okay, and yeah. and did you? I mean, did you start out doing that out of high school? No. Uh, so I'm. I just actually just had a birthday. Uh, I'm oh, happy, happy now. late birthday! <laughs> Thank you. So, I've had uh, jobs here and there. My first job, I actually was only four bucks an hour and the people would try to cheat me out of my money all the time. So I would have to count, they would give cash. <laughs> I would have to count the cash every week and pay attention to my hours because they would cheat me every time. But, uh, what were you yeah, doing there? Uh, that was at just a restaurant. Okay. A fast food place. And that was post high school. So, yeah, that, that, well, it was kind of during high school, uh, my okay. junior year senior year I was there and actually kind of a funny story with them is they they closed the business and they didn't give me my final check so I ended up finding out where they lived and I went to their house and knocked on their door and the the daughter of the owner uh answered the door and was surprised to see that I found out where they lived <laughs> and you know at that time when you're that young a uh, hundred dollars is a lot of money when you're only making four dollars an hour. So I don't even remember how much it was that they owed me, but you know that that's quite a bit of money. And I ended up getting the money from them, but it, it was kind of uh, an uneasy feeling. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, but yeah, so I, I worked there. I worked at McDonald's for a little <laughs> bit. <laughs> You know, did all those little. I worked at a bike shop in town um, for a little bit. Uh, what else have I done? I worked at a uh, before I started as a garbage man. I actually worked at a uh, heating and air conditioning wholesaler, and I got my commercial license through them. And what's funny was uh, I, I was I was only making around ten dollars an hour at the time. And I remember I went to them and I asked the uh, owner, this is after I got my commercial license. I said, Hey, um, you know, I, I got more responsibility here driving these trucks. Uh, I think I, I'd like to ask for a raise. And he came back to me and he said, you know, it's, it's, it's not in the cards. I'm 
sorry, we can't, we can't cut that right now. So I said, all right. But in the meantime, I had seen the place that I worked at. They they had uh, the garbage company had a sign out front, drivers wanted. And I said, you know what? I'm going to stop by there. I don't think I'll be able to get the job, but I'll stop by. So I stopped and I filled out an application. They called me the next day for an interview, and I did the interview. And they said, okay, well, when can you start? And I'm like, excuse me. He goes, can you start next week? And I'm like, well, I got to give them at least a week's notice. So. Went back to my former boss and said, hey, I got another job. And they were actually offering me $2 an hour more than the prior job right off the bat. And plus, being a garbage man, it's a union job. So I, I have a, a pension as well, which helps a lot. Um, no 401k or anything like that, but uh, pension, which is fairly rare nowadays. Uh, yeah, let's let before you get into that real quick. I, I want to dive into just overall net worth, and then we can kind of look at the allocation and, and get in because pension is pretty pretty unique, especially when you don't have retirement accounts. So, what is your net worth? Uh, I'm right around 1.5 um, million right okay. now. And then you said 250 is in the pension. Yeah, so 250 was last year, and okay. I'm assuming that will be considerably more. Um, we don't get a pension. Uh, calculation until April to May. Okay. So, I and you do include that in your net worth? Yeah, I did. Okay. Yeah. And then what's the rent? I mean, obviously we've got the rentals at this point, five rentals that make up a chunk of that, correct? Yeah. So the rentals, um, minus all my expenses and everything, I'm right between the 675 to 700,000 in, uh, equity and pay down. Okay. Um, and actually note that when I bought each one of those rentals, I put 25% down on all of them. So wow. uh, that that does help the cash flow, Yeah, um, obviously. Yep, yep. But it also gets a lower rate than, than most would get. Um, so that also helps as well. And I'm in a very high, high tax area. I don't, I'm not sure if there's any other state, because I'm in Illinois, I don't think there's many other states higher than Illinois. I think they might take the crown as the highest property tax around. <laughs> and anything else in your net worth or, or just those two yes. things? No. So, so I have uh, my primary, um, which I have roughly 290 to 300,000 in equity. When I sold my last house, I rolled everything into that to pay it down as well. And I'm not really interested in paying that one off too quickly um because that's one that i have about a two and a half percent interest rate on which is pretty good uh then i also have i have a bunch of money in vanguard that i started in 2016 uh mainly index funds but i do play around with some here and there i have quite a bit in apple and uh nvidia those are two of my favorites uh so that's about 130 in there um, I have a Edward Jones account, which I just checked it, uh, which is right around a hundred thousand right now. And, uh, then I, I carry a higher amount in cash than most people do. I have about, uh, between 85 to 90,000 right now in cash. Um, you know, my, my accounts are savings account is paying 4%, which is fairly high. So I, Right now, with how markets are doing and with how prices on houses and everything are high, I'm I'm pretty comfortable with keeping that much kind of on the sidelines. You're you're getting paid right now for patience to, to be somewhat patient with everything. So I, I've kind of kept that there. The thing that kind of think from a lot of people that's helped me build up those numbers is it's that automatic savings part. You know, you you get a system. You start saving and you go from there. Uh, every week or every month, I have three hundred and fifty dollars, which isn't much, but it goes directly into a Vanguard brokerage into uh, into index funds. Then I save four thousand dollars a month into my savings every month, uh, and then another five hundred actually. So it's actually forty five hundred goes into savings. One goes into a different savings than the others, but. Uh, yeah, it's about forty five hundred a month plus the three fifty a month. So you probably six, eh, probably around five thousand a month. I I put into savings, um, and 
I kind of engineered it that way to save what I make at my job so that I can retire in the next four years and have peace of mind that I'm not just like jumping into retirement, not knowing what I'm going to spend. Um, if I know I can save a lot, then I know I, I'm okay. That's a, yeah, that's great to be saving that much. Um, g- going back a tiny bit, uh, you mentioned that you listen to a lot of podcasts while you, while you do your route. How many hours yeah. a day are you listening to? Oh, geez. So uh, in the past, <laughs> a 12-hour day was pretty normal. Um, I've worked as much at, as far – I've worked almost 14 hours a day. We're only allowed to get up to 60 hours a week, uh, Department of Transportation rules on that. But I, I would come really close to that. So I'm in the truck, and it's basically it's all day that I have podcasts on. Um, I, I had, like, the uh, Bigger Pockets, uh, all their podcasts going, mm-hmm. um, just to kind of try to learn a little bit about the stock market. I like to listen to Jim Cramer a bit. Um, there's a newer one that I that I started listening to called uh, Founders. For me, it's newer. I, I think it's been out, around for a while. But the guy kind of discusses books about people that are entrepreneurs or um, along that line. Uh, Stanky Benjamins, Afford Anything, uh, Rent Prep for Landlords, Ramit Savy. Uh, my one of my favorite to listen to is uh, Clark Howard. He's a mm-hmm. I'd love to meet him someday or at least maybe talk to him someday because he's so humble and someone to look up to. And and I, I love that about him. Um, you know, it's not all about real estate or anything like that. It's about just about everything. He's a consumer advocate and he's he's awesome. So <laughs> Wow. And and you know, I'm sure Millionaire Millionaires Unveiled is on that list if it's uh maybe it's at the top, I don't know. Um, <laughs> yes, and- that is- <laughs> so you're listening to a lot of podcasts and how, and how about books? How many books are you reading a year or listening to a year? <laughs> so yeah, books wise, I don't really read that much. I have a seven year old son that keeps me very busy. <laughs> so that night I have a, uh, my attention span for reading isn't that solid. <laughs> so sure, sure. sorry, I, I'm in audio books. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, audio book wise. Yeah, I, I discovered uh, I was I was paying Audible for a while, and uh, then I found out that my library has an app that allows you to uh, rent six books a month. So I started doing that. So it's uh, you know once I, I'm I'm more on the podcast side, but I do I, you know I've discovered quite a few books that have had some really good pointers or I'll take, have little takeaways here and there. Um, you know, there's like, there's, uh, it's, it's not like religion where you listen to everybody and you take every single nugget that they give you away from it. There's some people have great things that they're telling you, but not everything that they're telling you is going to be, maybe, maybe it works for them or it just, just doesn't work for you. I don't know. Um, totally. Totally. And as we've learned on this show, there are just so many paths um, and there's no one right answer. Um, so, you, so you're listening to all these audio books. You're, you're listening to books about real estate or you're sorry, you're listening to podcasts about real estate. You're listening to podcasts about index investing. And then over time you, you, you build your confidence and then do you start looking for properties locally? Is that what happened next? Yeah, I just, I went through uh, the MLS and, and found a couple here or there. And, you know, like I talked to my real estate friend and uh, she suggested, Hey, let's look at a handful. And to be honest, like, I really didn't know what I was looking for. And I, I stumbled upon the, my first, which Cash flow wise, I really don't make much on it. I, I bought it on a 15 year mortgage. So, you know, the payment's going to be higher regardless. But I, I also I also took what I made extra principal and I would put it towards a principal. So it's nearly paid off now five years in, which I guess is kind of, you know, yeah, I'm not making the big cash flow, but it's being paid off, which is massive. Other than that's that's about the only way that I've 
that I've done it. You know, I, I, I don't know if I answered your question there or not. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. So, um, so it's, uh, when you took out a 15 year mortgage, did you take out a, a fixed or a variable rate and, or in, in general for your mortgages? Yeah, everything is uh, fixed. Okay. And back around then, the mortgages were higher to begin with. So being an investor, you generally will get higher loan rate as well. And me putting down 25% actually helped quite a bit. Uh, I know a lot of people, they have, everybody has a different strategy. For me, slow and steady was best. I know like sitting here now, I could go back and say, oh my God, I could have had $5 million with how houses are so high valued at. I just bought one and rehabbed it, took all my money out of it and put it into the next one. But as I went along on this, there's so much stuff that you learn that's not in a podcast or not in a book. It's it's a lot like good way to good way to kind of think of it is it's riding a bike. You can read books all day long about riding bikes until you actually get on one and do it. You can't put any of those lessons that you learned to task and see what actually works for you or, or what those people are actually talking about. You know, some of it's so over your head, you have no idea what they're talking about. So, yeah, I, I, I took what I could and and put that knowledge into the first one. And when that first one worked out, it just happened that I still had some money on hand. And with it being rented right away, I it, it was great, you know, and, um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's went up. So the, the, all of my properties have grown so much in value. It's unbelievable. Um, uh, a lot of it was sweat equity. You know, I'm, I'm very lucky and, and, and it's just that it, I was born, you know, I still, my mom and my, my mom and dad are still alive. Um, I have a great brother and sister my dad has always been like somebody that I've looked up to and watched do things. He never would call somebody to have something done. Uh, he would struggle through it and get done with it if he had to. But he was, if something was broken, he would fix it. And I always looked up to that. So I've always kind of went along that way. Okay, I could fix that. That's no problem, you know. And I, I feel like if you're doing, if you're buying houses and you, are just going by the books you read or the podcast and you're going to hire people to do it, you're going to lose money pretty fast because these contractors and that, they will charge you a lot. So you have to mm -hmm. have some kind of knowledge to begin with. You know, my, my grandpa used to say they can take everything away from you, but they can't take what's in between your ears. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, it makes a lot of sense. The more knowledge you have, the better you, off you are. And, I credit so much of where I'm at now to just being behind the wheel of the truck and listening to podcasts. It's, you know, it's, it's incredible just what I've been able to get to now. And then, uh, it's always, it's, you know, not to go too far with it, but it, it's been kind of an uphill, um, upstream swim for me too. Cause I haven't had a lot of support from people. Uh, I don't have a lot of people around me that have been, in this where they've rented stuff i've had so many people early on tell me oh you're dumb i can't why are you putting your money at your oh they're gonna ruin your house you're gonna rent it bad bad idea you know i've had so much of that and to be where i'm at now is like wow this is it's actually working at least so far so <laughs> hopefully it continues this way Jeff, I, I mean, congrats on 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 the success so far. I mean, it's pretty remarkable. Where do you go from here? You know, as it relates to your net worth, your investment strategy. I know you mentioned that for the most part, you're content probably with your rental properties. But do you have a target net worth? Are you looking for a certain passive income goal? What does the outlook look like? I'd like. I'm I'm close to the big goal of mine was to have ten thousand in rental income. You know, obviously, I still have the bills to add in with that monthly, but uh, to to be getting ten thousand a month off the rentals is is nice. And I I, I want to be prepared to be able to retire early. Uh, I'm I'm like I said, I'm forty eight now, and I'd like to retire with twenty five years in uh, with my union, and then be 
be able, you know, to kind of call the shots from there. If I want to work more, then I work more or, or otherwise just spend time with my my son, significant other, their kids. The the biggest takeaway in my my mind with it is more having my kid be able to look to me because I I remember watching my dad and, and, you know, he's like my hero with stuff and watching him do things. I I want my son to be able to look at me and say, you know, like, Oh, I, you know, my my dad did it. I can do it. You know? And I think that's what separates the, the uh, upper class. So say from lower class people, a lot of times is, they already had, they have the head start to show their children how it's done. So it's easy for them to kind of go, Oh yeah, this is already done. So, you know, when somebody kind of climbs their way through, it's, it's pretty incredible to do it on your own without the support or the upfront knowledge, you know, it, it's, it's pretty remarkable on people that are able to do that. And um, yeah, you've guys, you, you've had quite a few guests on that have, been there you know and the negatives on it and and you see how much somebody can build in such such a short period of time i mean like with me it was 2016 i i don't think i had that much of a net worth at at that point and you know i i started with the houses and going oh let me see what i could do here and it built from there yeah, that's <laughs> and, and and Jeff to that end about you know learning from above or learning you know learning from your own doing. What has been that biggest learning point, learning lesson um, of your real estate journey? Oh, geez, uh, <laughs> the the ones along the way that were good and bad. <laughs> um, so I learned to have a real estate agent that has experience. That's a big one. Um, in fact, one of the houses, my primary residence, I bought, oh, geez, back around uh, 2005, I bought it. I bought it with an agent who had never bought or sold a house before. And when I sold that house, I probably lost 160 to 200,000 on that house. So, and it was all because not having someone there with experience to kind of guide along the way, you know, that knew what they were doing. As far as things that I, there are things that I haven't uh, heard people ever bring up in, in a podcast or anything like that. When, when you buy a duplex and it's occupied or a single family and it's rented, make sure you get the security deposit. Because a lot of times, like the agents or whatever, they won't even think about that. But when you're closing on that house, you got that security deposit. That's an extra chunk of money. The other thing, I, I'm, I'm a little bit of a different person. I went through a, uh, an eviction last year. I evicted somebody. And it was kind of exciting to me, which I know is really strange to say. But it was exciting to me because it was something that I didn't hear a lot about on the podcast. The evictions. Oh, my God. You got to evict somebody. It's the worst thing ever. Yeah, it wasn't great. I probably, you know, lost rent, lawyer fees, um, repairs was around $8,000, but I was able to learn from it. And I learned that you should carry, have your, um, have your tenants all carry renter's insurance. That's not the only thing though. You have to have yourself as additionally insured on their policy. That way, if they stop paying the policy, you're going to be notified and you can continue to pay that when they move out. If they destroyed the whole house, you're still covered under their policy. So it doesn't go back to their policy or back to your policy and hit you, or you don't you have to absorb all that cost. So those are a couple of things that I kind of thought about that were kind of big that I never heard anybody really talk about. <laughs> and, oh, and, and the, uh, the tax incentives are, insane on that compared to a a w-2 on your rental properties Um, because you figure like with your w-2 job you're losing about a third of what you make Uh, and and with your rental properties it's nothing like that you know you get so many things that you're able to write off depreciating um, these are things that i all these things that i learned like the depreciation that you could take on a house the accelerated depreciation you can take on a house it's it's unbelievable. And I actually, I make more, 
more money on my rental properties than I do at my W-2 job. And especially now, <laughs> you know, like I cut back to only four days a week, week at work. So it, it's, it's unbelievable, you know, and I, I live a very comfortable life. I, I love the neighborhood I, I live in. My neighbors are outstanding. Um, my son has a great school to go to. Uh, and it's a lot it has to do with, you know, being able to, to do rental properties. <laughs> I'll, I always come back to that. That was the one that works for me. Those are some great tips. And I love the ones that people might, might not have heard before. Yeah. Jeff, let's uh, transition here to, to some rapid fire questions as we wrap up here. What's the uh, most expensive meal out that you've paid for? Oh boy. Uh, I, I bought a Wagyu, um, Tomahawk steak once. Okay. And, I think that was about 160 and yeah i just I, you know i had to try it once <laughs> <laughs> would you try it again i don't know if i would <laughs> yeah one one time experience one time was good it was good it was good, good. <laughs> what about the uh, most expensive car that you purchased the truck that i have i have a honda ridgeline and some people will say it's not really a truck but whatever <laughs> it's that i paid i paid thirty one thousand for it uh used okay. but there's so much room in it and there's a trunk under the bed so i put all my tools and everything for the houses in there so then uh they're out of the way i never even see it until i have to go to one of the houses and do work on it okay do you use a credit card yes but i i pay the balance uh every month Okay. What has been the best bucket list experience or travel that you've paid for and how much was it? Oh, geez. I love Hawaii. And uh, what I didn't bring up, which I probably should, which is kind of a, a giant part of this whole equation of everything. So my my son's mother passed away when he was two. We were together and I think bucket list wise, travel, all that stuff's great, but I think this is probably the biggest thing for me. So she, uh, he was born and he was only three months old when she was diagnosed with uh, stage three breast cancer. So through all this journey of everything, she continued to fight uh, cancer and unfortunately she lost her life to it. But during that time, I, I I took her on a trip to Seattle. I took her on a trip to Hawaii. We actually, when she stopped the first round of uh, chemo and all that, um, I took her to Hawaii for a gift, which was awesome. She loved it. Greatest person that I ever knew. She's just amazing. She went through so, so much stuff, smiling the whole time, taking pictures of her journey along the way. Um, but I think the biggest thing for me with all this is that I was able to take off of work without pay or anything and sit with her while she was in a nursing home and in hospice the last uh, few months of her life without having to really think too much, putting money first, I put, you know, family first. And I think that was the biggest thing. You know, I, I hear a lot of people make excuses about why they can't do things. And um, kind of the Robert Kiyosaki way of uh, saying, you know, don't say I can't, but say, how can I? And I think that was kind of a, a big thing for me was at that time, I only had two properties, but uh, that was like the base of starting the financial freedom with it, being able to do that and not be stressed over bills in any way was was huge. Dang, man, I feel like that's a great way to end the show. Holy cow, thanks for sharing. That was, I mean, that was that was deep. That was phenomenal. But kudos to you for, for getting in that position and, and, and doing all that. And, man, I... Uh, yeah, she passed away when he was uh, only two. So, man. unfortunately, you know, he doesn't really, you know, maybe he has some memories of her, but he's not going to have the, the great times and everything. So uh, it's it, it's heartbreaking to me, obviously, and I don't, yeah. I don't mean to bring the show on a bad. No, I mean this is this is I mean this is real life, right? And this stuff affects you, affects the way you think about money, and way it affects. The, I mean, you just shared the the experiences that you all took that you know are, are 
you know, just priceless to some degree because of, you know, the timing that those happened. And, and I think it's important because some of these things, you know, we, we bottle up, we don't talk about, you know, we, we deal with them. And now that you're in a position maybe, you know, to discuss them, I think, it, you know, people are going to resonate with that. I mean, you know, just for me personally, I mean, not getting too personal myself, but like my mom's been a breast cancer survivor and a pancreatic cancer survivor, which the, the statistics behind that are just like, you know, I mean, she's, it's zero, 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 one percent type thing, you know, so I've gone through that with my family, you know, a couple of different times where we've tried to kind of accelerate some of those experiences just because you don't know what's going to happen, you know, but it, it, yeah. it, it kind of brings back to like, don't forget to live in the now type thing, you know, as you plan for the future, you know? Yeah. Yeah. We never knew that, you know, time was limited even while she was going through it. She was an absolute incredible fighter, you know, just, she would go through treatments and, and post pictures of herself smiling as she's going through the treatments and, you know, just to have the mindset that she did during it was absolutely incredible. And, I, I've never seen anybody be that much of a champion ever. And to be able to be there with her, um, you know, she's, she had great friends and family. Uh, I still talk to her friends quite a bit. They're, they're wonderful. Uh, to still be able to get together once a year on her birthday, we have her favorite meal and yeah, it's, it's just wonderful to, to have that connection and actually have been able to, be there to support her um, in in probably the darkest days and toughest times. Yeah. Kudos to you, man. That's, that's, that's awesome. And uh, I really do appreciate you sharing that. That's very personal to, to get into that. So uh, to wrap up here, I mean, are there any mistakes that you've made along the way or any particular advice that you would leave somebody who's just starting out? Uh, <laughs> there's, plenty of mistakes and I'm sure I'm going to make way more. <laughs> so I, I mean, even, you, you got to go along and, and do it on your, on your own. You have to do it sometimes on your own, uh, even against the advice of some people. But when you have the knowledge, when you learn about something and you have the knowledge, you almost have to step back and look at the people who are telling you that not that they are bad people, but maybe they just don't know or they're afraid in their own life because a lot of the stories that I heard from people saying, oh, don't do this, don't ever do that, you're buying properties, that's terrible. Uh, now I'm hearing more of, yeah, it must be nice or, uh, you know, yeah, I would have done that. But so getting started is a big thing, uh, but definitely having the knowledge before you start makes a difference. At least in my case, you know, that the, with the knowledge came the confidence. As long as you have the knowledge, (laughs) the confidence will follow or the confidence, you know, it it adds to everything. Awesome. That's Jeff with a net worth of 1.5 million. Thanks for coming on the show today. Hey, thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the Millionaires Unveiled podcast with Jace Mattinson. For more stories, investment opportunities, and information, check out our website, millionairesunveiled.com. See you next time when you'll hear from another everyday millionaire.